Right. So um, this is this is Mark Smith. I don't think Mark needs an introduction. Uh, he's he's working for MongoDB. He's going to tell us lots of things that you probably don't know about MongoDB. So off you go. Thank you. Um, hi everybody. Uh, I'm known as GD2K online generally uh, for reasons that aren't that interesting. Um, and I joined MongoDB last December, so I've been there around seven or eight months, and I'm reasonably experienced. Uh, in the past, I've built systems on top of MySQL and Postgres, lots of stuff on SQLite, Redis, CouchDB, Solar, but I'd never actually used MongoDB before. So I've been learning a lot over the last seven to eight months. Um, and uh, there were two primary things that I really learned. One is that MongoDB is uh, really powerful and kind of fun. Uh, and the other is that almost everything that anyone says about MongoDB online is wrong. So I'm going to spend the next um, 20 to 25 minutes trying to bust a few myths and give you an idea of what MongoDB is, what it isn't, and how it works. So primarily this talk is aimed at um, people who don't currently use MongoDB and might be interested in, in what it is and hopefully um, sort of working their way through some of the misinformation that's online. If you use MongoDB regularly, you probably know what it does, but it is a big and complex product. So hopefully you might learn something new anyway. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so uh, uh, before I really get started in, in the real myths, um, there's this video on YouTube. Um, and it, it, it involves two dogs kind of having an argument and one uh, one uses a lot of technical jargon and a lot of slogans um, to describe how amazing MongoDB is and the other dog is actually a bit more down to earth and increasingly gets frustrated with the first dog and how uh, unrealistic it is. And when I announced that I was going to work at MongoDB, a friend of mine sent me a link to this video immediately just in case I hadn't seen it. And the thing is this video was published in 2010 it's 10 years old and you all think that no one at MongoDB has seen it um, and nothing could be further from the truth. Next slide, please. This is my colleague Max uh, and like me and everyone else at MongoDB, he has seen the video on YouTube. Um, he has also bought the t-shirt. He's wearing his MongoDB is WebScale t-shirt. If you were to walk around our head office in New York, you would see um, this sticker on about half the laptops in the office. So the next time you're tempted to send this 10 year old video to somebody who works for, for MongoDB, uh, maybe if you could think twice, I'd really appreciate it. Cause it was funny at the time, but it's almost all incorrect now. And I'm going to to counteract a lot of the misinformation that it's it's been so easily spreading for about 10 years. Um, so next slide please. So now that I've got that out of the way I'm just going to give a very high level overview of what MongoDB is in case you really haven't touched it at all. Next slide please. So MongoDB is a clustered database. Um, the minimum number of machines you can have in a cluster is three if you want to have high availability and you don't want to lose any data. Um, you need an odd number of machines in your cluster so that they can have a little conversation among themselves and elect a primary. Now the primary is the machine that essentially handles all the connections to the cluster. So once, you've, once a primary is elected, all the clients, um, whether it's your Python client or any of the other language clients that, that can be used to connect to MongoDB, will connect to the primary. And it's the primary's responsibility to stream data down to the secondaries. So they all store the same data, but the secondaries can be um, slightly out of date. So this obviously is for redundancy, it's for, for data resilience rather than scalability because all those, um, the, the primary essentially acts as a bottleneck to the cluster. You can force your client to connect to one of the secondaries to do say analytics queries on a machine that's under slightly less read load. And that's kind of an interesting model, but you have to understand that you will be working with stale data if you're talking to the secondary because the data comes in through the primary first. Um, next slide, please. I have to keep moving backwards and forwards between my notes and what's on the screen. Um, so what do we store in this database cluster? Um, well, MongoDB is a document database, so we store collections of documents. Now, a collection is like a table in a relational database, um, and a document looks a bit like this on the right. It's a map of key and keys and values. Uh, this document in particular is from our sample movies database. Um, it's for a movie called Blacksmith Scene that, that was filmed in 1893 and it's one minute long and it involves a blacksmith hammering at an anvil and then taking a break, wiping his brow, opening a beer and passing it round 
and then getting back to hammering on the anvil again. It's like a TikTok video from 1893, which I think is kind of cool, given that I didn't even realize they had movie cameras in 1893. Um, but I'd like to highlight a couple of um, things about this piece of information, this, this piece of data that I think are kind of interesting. So the first, uh, next slide please. So the first is that it's um, hierarchical and kind of multidimensional. So the cast value here is a subarray, and you can update individual parts of this document um, uh, individually. So you don't have to update the entire document each time. So I can append items to this array if I want to, or I can insert or delete items from the array. Um, the other thing is the IMDB value is uh, what we call in MongoDB a sub document, but in Python you would call a dict or a, um, in JSON you might call it an object. Um, next slide, please. And the other thing is that there's some values here that have, are of types that aren't available in JSON. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But object ID, uh, the ID is an object ID type, which is a special type we use for um, generated IDs in the cluster. And released is um, displayed here as a native Python date time object. It's not actually stored um, in the database uh, as a Python date time object, but it is a, a native MongoDB date time object. And the Python driver converts that into something that's useful for you as a Python developer um, when it's retrieved from the database. So next slide, please. And I'll be covering those, uh, some of the, why this, some of this is important um, in a later slide. So the first myth about MongoDB is that it's on version 2.4. You won't see people kind of promoting that fact online, um, but if you install a relatively recent version of Ubuntu, uh, sorry, Debian, like uh, Debian Jesse, and um, and run apt install MongoDB, you will get version 2.4. The problem is that version 2.4 was released in 2013, so it's um, getting on for eight years old, and there have been seven or eight major releases since then, each of them fixing bugs and adding features um, and, uh, and increasing improving performance. In fact, the entire storage engine has been rewritten since then, so MongoDB um, 4.4, next slide please, um, is a is almost a completely different database um, to 2.4. And if you're interested in actually um, installing an up-to-date version of MongoDB, Google MongoDB community, follow the first link that, that goes to the MongoDB website and follow the instructions for installing it on your, your favorite um, Linux, Mac or Windows distribution. Uh, next slide, please. So the first myth, uh, second myth, sorry, that I've already alluded to um, is that the um, that MongoDB is a JSON database. Uh, you will see this quite a lot. It's a very per pervasive myth. Next slide, please. In fact, at the moment, it's on the MongoDB homepage um, that we store richer JSON documents. Um, but this isn't actually true. Next slide, please. MongoDB is a BSON database. Um, and this may sound like a, a sort of minor technicality because a BSON it stands for binary, um, actually I don't know what the S stands for. Anyway, it's a binary uh, object notation. Um, it's not just a, a sort of binary version of JSON. Um, it's much more efficient to store and traverse than JSON, which you would kind of expect from, from the fact that it's binary, but it also includes extra data types um, that are like the ones that I showed you before. And the ones you'd really care about as a developer are the ability to efficiently store binary blob data. Um, it stores date times natively, so you can query against different aspects of a, of a date a timestamp that's stored in the database. And it also includes various different numeric types like decimal numbers that are good for storing currency. Um, this is important because BSON is totally fundamental to MongoDB. It's the um, format of the protocol that's used to talk to the server. It's not a REST um, uh, query that you use to, to talk to MongoDB. There's a, a binary streaming protocol built on BSON. Database queries are actually BSON structs. Database results are BSON. MongoDB is fundamentally a BSON database. Next slide, please. Another thing you will hear about MongoDB everywhere is that it, it doesn't support transactions, that it's a, um, I forget what base stands for, basic availability soft state eventual consistency database. And two of those have never been true. Um, and there's a reason for this myth existing. It's that, that essentially two years ago, we didn't support transactions. Next slide, please. 
two years ago, uh, we added transactions to MongoDB in version 4.0. And then last year, um, transactions were extended to, to support sharded clusters. So now whatever type of cluster you're, uh, you have for MongoDB will support transactions. Um, but despite this, um, it's not so necessary to use transactions in MongoDB as it is in traditional relational databases. Because we have a rich document format that allows you to store nested related data together in a document, um, you don't need to do so many joins across collections or tables to update data. So you don't need a transaction to, assure, um, to ensure that those data updates are done atomically. Updates within a single document are atomic by themselves. So if you have a good database design and you're storing related data together, then you can do the, you can update the, all of that data to, in, in one atomic um, operation. Having said that, now that MongoDB supports transactions, for those times where you do need to do um, uh, uh, updates across different collections or across different documents, um, that facility is available to, to you. But if you're doing it too much, you probably need to look at your data design, your model design, um, and, and try to uh, factor that out as much as possible. Next slide, please. Um, Another thing that goes hand in hand with the transactions thing is that MongoDB doesn't support relationships, that you can, you can retrieve multiple documents, but you can't uh, join across collections. Um, and this hasn't been true for quite some time. Um, so we support uh, joins, left outer joins, um, and have done for quite some time using a type of query called an aggregation pipeline. Next slide, please. Um, so that doesn't say a lot. So uh, aggregation pipelines, um, uh, uh, yes, it's been supported since 2.2. Um, next slide, please. So I'll show you just quickly what an aggregation pipeline actually looks like. It's a set of operations you can conduct on a collection. Um, that, and then uh, they're optimized so that they can be reordered or filtered out um, based on uh, what will uh, work most optim optimally with the data and the type of query that you're doing. Now, one of these operations is called a lookup operation. So here I'm conducting a single um, aggregation operation on the orders collection, starting at the top. Um, and this is doing a left outer join with the inventory collection where orders.item equals um, inventory.sku and then it will embed the resulting documents um, in a sub document called inventory docs. Next slide please. So, so this it becomes a bit clearer and one more slide please. Um, this becomes a bit clearer when you can actually see the kind of data that's returned. So here it's looked up some documents um, matching that relationship in inventory, and then it's embedded them in the resulting order document. So here the, this happens to only have one embedded document, but because this is a one-to-many relationship, you could it's an array of documents that comes back. So you could have multiple documents in here. And I quite like this because when you do this kind of query in a relational database, it flattens it down into duplicated rows in the resulting um, in the result set. So uh, whereas MongoDB actually takes advantage of the fact it's a hierarchical document format and embeds it in there. So not only does MongoDB support relationships uh, and joins, I think it actually does it quite intuitively. Next slide, please. Um, another thing people will talk about quite early on if you're discussing the pros and cons of MongoDB is sharding. Um, and there's a reason for this. Sharding is a pretty cool feature. Um, sharding is when you take your entire data set and you divide it into um, separate pieces. So you take all of your data, um, you maybe divide it down the middle and then you have what are called two shards. So they're two um, separate data sets that are related. Um, and then you take one of those um, data sets and you put it on a cluster and then you put the other data set and put it on another cluster so you now have two shards and when you do queries you you ideally move uh, send the queries to the to the cluster that holds the data that you want to get back next slide please the problem with this is that i said you need a minimum of three machines in a cluster um it, as soon as you have two shards as soon as you have sharding you need uh, you need three machines per cluster so you're looking at a minimum of six um database servers. And because you need to send the queries and the data updates to the correct shards, you actually need some servers to negotiate that in front of them. So you need a shard server. And because you want redundancy, if, in case one of the machines goes down, you actually need a minimum of two of these machines. So you've gone from a minimum of three machines, which is a significant cost in a production environment, to a minimum of eight machines. Next slide, please. So what we recommend generally is if you're working with large data um, that isn't currently performant on your cluster or won't 
currently fit on your current machine, we recommend you look at upgrading your machine first. As soon as you start adding shards, you start to limit the types of queries you can do. You add a huge amount of complexity to your operations cost in terms of actually managing the cluster. Um, so buy more RAM, for example. If your data isn't fitting in memory, buy more RAM. It's probably cheaper than buying another five servers or a faster processor if that's your bottleneck. Essentially look at the thing that's limiting your scaling um, and attempt to upgrade that first. Look at the cost of that first. Having said that, sharding is there for you if those um, aren't solutions at the current time. Um, another really interesting thing that sharding can do is if you shard on the location of the users who will be accessing the data, you can move that shard cluster to be geographically closer to those users so they get less latency when they're doing um, queries against your database, which I think is kind of cool. Um, next slide, please. Um, but if you are looking at upgrading your cluster, I recommend you look at MongoDB Atlas, which is the database hosting service that MongoDB run. So they'll run your database for you. They will handle scaling your cluster up and down as required. So you'll only be paying for the kind of usage you require. And it still supports sharding and things like that if you need them at a late, later date. Also, it takes huge amounts of operation spend away in terms of doing backups and, um, and handling redundancy and things. Next slide, please. So the reason people talk about sharding is because uh, micro sharding used to be a big thing. So back in 2.4, if I remember correctly, um, MongoDB um, had a lock um, in the storage engine that meant that it could only efficiently use one core on a machine. So it was a bit like the global interpreter lock in Python um, to that respect. Actually, I, I apologize. It was before MongoDB 3.2. Um, so some enterprising DBAs discovered that if they sharded their data and ran multiple shards on a single machine, they could make use of all the cores on that machine, which was quite clever, but a bit of a hack. Um, and this, this got known as micro sharding. Since um, 2015, MongoDB uh, has a non-blocking storage engine um, called Wired Tiger, which doesn't require this anymore. So it makes full use of the cores on your machine. So people used to talk about sharding because it was required to optimally um, work on multi-core machines. Um, but this is another historical thing. Next slide, please. Oops, that wasn't meant to come up. These are my slides that, um, uh, that were actually disabled and somehow it's exported them to PDF anyway. Could we move to the next? I'll keep on saying next until we get to next, <laughs> next, uh, next, next, next. Uh, that stop. It was the last slide, please. So myth number six, MongoDB is insecure. Um, so uh, there have certainly been data breaches um, with MongoDB um, and it has developed a bit of a reputation for it, which I think is slightly unfair. Next slide, please. So um, the cause of this is that MongoDB um, in most distributions with the older versions automatically binds to the network and it, is, it automatically starts up with no authentication. Um, so hopefully when you're hosting a production server or anything on the internet, you have a firewall either on your machine or in front of your machine or both. Um, it's the default on Amazon Web Services to have a firewall um, that only exposes your SSH port. Um, unfortunately, uh, less, some less experienced developers, I would say, um, would usually develop their services as a separate app server and database server. And when they found that they couldn't connect to their database server, they would log into all the uh, firewalls uh, that were available and essentially open up the MongoDB port and at no point think about adding authentication to their database. And what this means when you expose that port to the internet is that anyone, a bot will find your instance of MongoDB and essentially steal your data. Or these days what it does is it encrypts all your data within your database and adds a document telling you where to send Bitcoin to get your data unlocked. Um, I would argue that if, as a DBA, you put an unsecured database on the internet and somebody steals your data, then it's, pro it's more your fault than anything else. But modern versions of MongoDB also don't um, have, follow this behavior anymore. So nowadays, MongoDB won't bind to the network. It will only be accessed from localhost um, until you've added some authentication. You can use an override flag to override that, that security feature if you want to. You still can stick unsecured um, instances of MongoDB on the internet if you really want to, but I strongly recommend that you don't do that. Um, on top of this, MongoDB uh, uses industry standard security. It uses TLS for connections by default. It uses Scram SHA-256 for authentication. Um, there's no reinventing the wheel here. MongoDB is no less secure than any other database you might use. Next slide, please. 
And another quite persistent myth about MongoDB is that it loses data. And I will try to explain where this myth comes from. Next slide, please. So first, I would just say it's difficult to prove a negative. MongoDB is used and trusted by some big banks like Barclays and Morgan Stanley. And if it lost data, then I think that would be unlikely. It's also used in a bunch of other industries that really care about not losing their data. Um, next slide, please. The reason people, um, people lose data in MongoDB um, is because MongoDB as actually allows you to trade off between the robustness of your data um, and performance. And the default is perhaps not ideal. So um, by default, when you're updating, uh, when you send an update to your MongoDB cluster, um, it uses a thing called a, a, a configuration option called a write concern, which by default is set to one. And this means that as soon as the data has been accepted by one of the databases, one of the servers in your cluster, which will be the primary, um, you get an acknowledgement back that the data has been accepted. Um, unfortunately, this means that if you get your acceptance back and then the primary goes down with a catastrophic disk failure, then you've lost your data. So that's not ideal from a, from a perspective of caring about not losing your data. So. Um, Almost every time, unless you really, really, really care about squeezing out all performance and you don't mind losing some data from time to time, you should use a right concern of majority, which means in a cluster of three machines, it will be accepted by two of those machines and written to disk before you get an acknowledgement back that the data has been accepted. It's a little bit slower, but you won't lose your data. Um, again, this kind of stems from people not quite knowing what MongoDB is or how to use it, but I would say that the default is unhelpful in that case. Next slide, please. So this really sums up all of the other um, myths that I've covered. Um, people will talk about MongoDB being really easy, and I've certainly found it very easy to get started. Like storing data in a database is really easy if you have some JSON data that you can just, or, or just, some, just some data structures in Python, you can just start storing them in MongoDB without really knowing how to efficiently use the features that are in there, how you might lose data, how you might squeeze some extra performance out of it. You don't even need to know relational theory like you do with a relational database. You can just get started. And this is kind of a problem, I would say, overall um, in in terms of generating an image um, because you've got a lot of inexperienced users. Um, so its strength is also maybe one of its biggest disadvantages from a marketing perspective. Um, so it, what you really need to do is learn how to use MongoDB properly from an operations and a development perspective. And MongoDB themselves provide kind of two paths to this. The um, documentation is really comprehensive and it's always being expanded and revised. But less known is that MongoDB run this thing called MongoDB University, which is a bunch of online courses that you can do in many cases for free that will dive into different topics around MongoDB in terms of hosting or indexing or um, complex aggregation pipeline queries and really help you become an expert at using the product. So if you do decide to take up MongoDB and actually um, use it in production, I recommend doing a few of these courses to make sure that you're really um, using it um, properly and that you know all the features that are available to you. Next slide, please. I can't remember what, to, what quite what time I had until. Is it quarter two? So we have two minutes left officially, but we have a longer break after this, and so maybe you can overrun maybe by a minute or two. I think I only have two minutes anyway. So. Um, I just, uh, while I have an audience, I'd just like to pitch something that I personally have been working on recently. So um, my, my team are taking the John Hopkins University COVID-19 data set, which is stored as a bunch of CSV files that every so often change format or get updated to GitHub incorrectly. Um, and we're turn it, we've turned it into a queryable MongoDB database cluster. Um, it has a username and password of read-only, read-only. Um, if it sounds interesting, the bit.ly link here will take you to all the documentation on how to connect to it and use it from lots of different platforms. Um, so if you if you just kind of want to have a play with MongoDB um, and with an interesting data set that might teach you something useful, um, this is a good place for that. If you decide to build something either with it or without it that's based around COVID-19 and in some way good for humanity, we're offering free credits um, for, for anybody doing that. So if that sounds interesting as well, please do get touch, uh, in touch with me on the Discord. Um, next slide, please. So this slide had a lovely build up while I was talking, but you know, <laughs> just go straight to the end. Um, so now, unlike most of the people on the internet, um, you will hopefully be um, right about MongoDB at least 
some of the time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the excellent talk. That was just in time. And I love you. I love you. Too.